And good afternoon, um, members, and welcome to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Can I point out to members that mobile phones must be set on airplane mode or turned off? It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Can I ask members, please, if they're not speaking, if they would place their devices on mute? Um, so, agenda item one then is apologies. I have apologies from Mr. Hilditch. Any other apologies? Okay, thank you. Agenda item two then is the minutes of the 20, 20th of May 2021 in your table pack pages four to nine. Uh, are members content that these minutes are accurate? And do I have your permission to sign them? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agenda item three then is declaration of members' interests. <clears throat> members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the members' register of interest. Does any member have any interest to wish to declare this afternoon? Okay, thank you. Agenda item five then is correspondence, pages nine and ten of your pack. <coughs> uh, uh, members refer to correspondence dated the 21st of May at pages 9 of your pack from Mr. Colm Boyle, the Interim Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, regarding the MOR for our major capital projects report. Mr. Boyle has apologised for the delay and uh, advises that the work is now in its final stages. The Department of Finance Minister will be writing to executive colleagues imminently to seek agreement on <coughs> the MOR wording and request final sign off. Are members content? Content. Members are referred to correspondence then by email dated the 23rd of May 2021, page 10 of your pack, from Mr. Trevor McKee to the Audit Office regarding a statement concerning CCNI accounts. There's also further correspondence in this matter in your table pack, pages 11 and 12. Mr. McKee has copied the correspondence to the committee uh, and other relevant committees for noting. Um, Mr. Donnelly, have you any comment you wish to make on that? Uh, yeah, we have a is copied to us as well. Can you, can so, uh, and we're in dialogue. <coughs> we have been in dialogue with Mr. McKee, and we'll be in further dialogue. Um, I think he had an issue with. Uh, just, we reported on the Charity Commission accounts last year, and uh, he, uh, I think he had one point of wording, but it was after we published the report, uh, and we considered it, but we didn't actually change it. Uh, but we'll be in further dialogue with them as we we go through the uh, the next set of accounts of the Commission. <coughs> okay, members, there's ongoing dialogue between the Northern Ireland Lord Office and Mr. McKee. Are members content to note? Yep. Agreed? Agreed? Okay. Can I ask at this stage then if we could bring Mr. Patrick Barr, Director for the next agenda item, Ministerial Directions? Mr. Barr, can you see and hear us okay? Uh, yes, Chair. Thank can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, agenda item six, then, is Ministerial Directions, pages 12 to 94. Um, and we'll begin pages 14 to 42 in your table pack. Uh, we are joined for this item by Mr Donnelly. Uh, Kieran Donnelly is CBE, the Com Comptroller and Auditor General. Mr Neil Gray, a Director. Mr Patrick Barr, Director. Mr Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support <coughs> Officer for this section of the meeting. Um, again, can I ask members if they could, when they're not using their device, if they put it on mute? There's quite a bit of feedback there coming in, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. <coughs> members, we are considering five ministerial directions this afternoon, which are all historical to address this matter. Um, Mr Mike Brennan, the accounting officer and permanent secretary Department of the Economy, will be in front of the committee on the 17th of <coughs> June. When we can ask reasons uh, why there have been delays, a member should also note that the CNAG is taking forward with the department uh, a piece of work in terms of the cause of those delays, bringing these ministerial directions forward, and expects an update to outline what actions they have taken to ensure this will not happen again. <coughs> so, uh, number one is the extension to COVID restriction business uh, support scheme and large tourism and hospitality business support scheme. Um, 
on March the 31st, pages 12 to 26 of your pack. Members refer to correspondence from Mr Donnelly dated the 24th of May in your pack, pages 12 to 14, regarding ministerial direction to extend the COVID restriction business support scheme and the large tourism hospitality business scheme uh, to cover the period of the 31st of March. Um, Mike Brennan, the accounting officer at the Department of Economy, wrote to CNAG on the 19th of April to advise that Mr Brennan had sought a ministerial direction from the Department of the Economy Minister <coughs> Diane Dodds, MLA, on the 26th of February 2021. There are two further ministerial directions uh, to extend both these schemes beyond the 21st of March, which we will deal with separately after we have looked at these two. So the background, members, is that on the 18th of February, the Executive agreed to extend COVID restrictions that were in place at, a, uh, at the time of the 1st of April 2021. Both initiatives were designed as part of the initial policy response to the restrictions announced in October 2020, and it was never envisaged that the scheme would continue to operate for as long as they have. The accounting officer also advised that the proposal to extend the initiatives would result in an additional £21 million expenditure in this financial year. However, given the flexibility agreed by the executive, we have been advised that this should be um, containable from within the existing department of the economy allocation. Members, the minister provided two directions, one for each scheme, to the accounting officer on the 5th of March 2021. Uh, and I refer to the relevant correspondence of pages 15 to 26 of your pack, which underpins the decision to proceed with the delivery of the two schemes. The CNAG will keep the matter under review as the result of the 2020-21 financial statement progresses we, uh, and will then brief the committee <coughs> at the earliest opportunity. The CN CNAG, um, have you any comments you want to make at this point? Uh, just saying these first couple, they're, they're essentially extensions. Um, there were earlier ministerial directions, but they were sort of for a certain period of time. So these are just extending, um, so, so in other words, getting cover for, for additional money. It's as simple as that. Uh, Patrick Barr will be over more of the detail than, than I am, if there's anything extra to say, Patrick. Mr. Barr. Um, Chair, at the minute, um, to be honest, <coughs> I mean, not much more in that um, this one is an extension to uh, the two schemes that the world already directed. Um, at the 31st of March. Um, it was unknown at the time when the schemes were first set up and directed how long um, restrictions would last um, and so it wasn't foreseen that these schemes would be extended as far as they had. So this extension up to 31st of March then as you've mentioned there's a uh, th there's a further one. Um, it, I mean it's fair to say that we you mentioned the discussions we're having with the department about the delay in notifying some of these um, directions. Um, the, uh, so many of them I think in a short space of time and and maybe um, staff within the department not aware um, of, of some of the processes. So I've had discussions with the department and they're making sure that new arrangements are in place um, so as that is um, so as that doesn't happen again um, and staff are aware of the process now. Okay. Um, so are members content to note? Great. Great. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, then uh, two then is the extension to COVID restriction business scheme and large tourism and hospitality business support scheme to the beyond the 31st of March, pages 27 to 55 of your pack. And they refer to correspondence from Karen Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, dated the 24th of May 2021, at your pack 27 to 29, <coughs> excuse me, regarding two further ministerial directions to extend the COVID restriction business support scheme and the large tourism and hospitality business support scheme to cover the period of 31st of March. Mr. Brennan, uh, the accounting officer of the Department of Con the Economy wrote to the CNAG on the 19th of April to advise that he had sought ministerial direction from uh, <coughs> the Economy Minister Diane Dodds on the 23rd of, Mar 23rd of March 2021. And the background there is on, on the 18th of February also the Executive agreed to extend COVID restrictions that were in place at the time. However, later the same month it was accepted that the current restrictions uh, would continue beyond the 1st of April. And as a decision was required on whether the eligible applicants to the two ongoing initiatives should receive further top up grants to cover the new period of restrictions. Members, as discussed, the, the, uh, as the first part of the extension, both schemes were designed as part of an initial uh, response to the restrictions 
announced in October 2020, and it was never envisaged the scheme would continue to operate for as long as they have. Under the current restrictions, the weekly cost of further extending the scheme is estimated at £5 million. <clears throat> the accounting officer stated that any decision around further extensions to port of support will fall into the 2021-22 financial year and will require an executive commitment to fund. Members, so I refer you then to pages 29 to 50 of your pack and the relevant correspondence which underpins the decision to proceed with the delivery of the two schemes. Again, the CNAG will keep the matter under review uh, as the audit of the 2020-2021 financial statement progresses and as he plans the audit programme for 2021-22 financial statements. Mr Donnelly, have you anything you want to add to what I've just said? Nothing to add on that one, okay. Chair. Okay. Members, have you any comments or, or are you content to note? Content? Yep. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, <coughs> Ministerial Director number three, Bed and Breakfast, Guest House and Guest Accommodation Scheme, pages 56 to 79 of your pack. I refer to correspondence again from Mr Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, dated the 24th of May 2021, your pack, pages 56 to 58, regarding a Ministerial Direction to implement Bed and Breakfast, Guest House and Guest Accommodation Scheme. Mr Mike Brennan, the Accounting Officer of the Department of the Economy, wrote to the CNAG on the 19th of April to advise that he had sought a ministerial direction from the uh, Economy Minister Diane Dodds uh, on the 18th of January 21. On the same date, the Economy Minister submitted a paper to the Executive College providing details of the proposal, and it was agreed by the Executive at the Executive meeting on the 21st of January 2021. There was some delay in the department communicating the details to the CNAG, hence the delay in the CNAG's correspondence to the committee. The background then is on the 23rd of November 2020, the executive announced £300 million package of support initiatives to support vulnerable businesses. As part of this programme of support, £4.1 million has been allocated to a bed and breakfast guest house accommodation scheme. These represent three of the eight categories of tourists defined in the tourism brackets Northern Ireland Order 1992. Subsequently, on the 19th of February 2021, it was proposed that the scheme would be extended to cover hostels and bunkhouses. <coughs> the cost of the extension will be covered by the original allocation. The Department deemed the, the extension was within the scope of the direction already given and the further direction was not required. The £4.1 million fund will be aimed at more than 900 <coughs> certified tourist accommodation businesses severely impacted through the reduced income due to COVID-19. Members, the Minister issued a direction to the Accounting Officer to proceed with the scheme on the 22nd of January 2021. The CNAG has provided the relevant correspondence at pages 59 to 79 of your pack, which underpins the decision to proceed with the delivery of the scheme. The CNAG will keep this matter under review as the audit of the 2021 financial statement progresses and as he plans the audit programme 2021-22 financial statements. Mr Donnelly, again, have you any comment you want to add? There? Uh, no, th this is another one to plug gaps in some of the earlier okay. schemes, and I suppose the main issue that is just the late notification. Okay, members, any members, any comment? Are, they, are members content to note? Content? Content to note. Okay, so moving page, oh, sorry, agenda, MOD 4, um, High Street Stimulus Scheme, HSSS, pages 80 to 94 of your pack. I refer to correspondence again from Mr Donnelly dated the 24th of May in your pack, pages 80 to 82, regarding ministerial direction to implement the High Street Stimulus Scheme. Mr Brennan, the uh, accounting officer, wrote to the CNAG on the 11th of May 21 to advise that he had sought a ministerial direction from the Economy Minister Diane Dodds on the 22nd of April. 2021, the Minister sent a paper to the Executive on the 29th of April seeking to uh, the issuing of a ministerial direction which was agreed by the executive. A ministerial direction for the accounting officer to proceed with the scheme was subsequently made on the same day. The background is that on the 1st of April the executive agreed to the allocation of £145 million in funding for the High Street Stimulus Scheme. Its objective is to help boost demand in towns and city centres and the de department believes that there's a need to proceed urgently with the procurement, implementation and progressing the scheme to a state of operational readiness. Members, the CNAG has provided the relevant correspondent to pages 83 to 94 of your pack. 
Um, and Mr Donnelly will keep this matter under review as an audit of the 2020-21 financial statements progresses and as he plans the audit scheme for the 2021-22 financial statements. Mr Donnelly, again, have you any comment you want to add? Uh, yeah, this is a really big scheme, $145 million. Uh, This isn't a late one, this is more recent. Um, I suppose that why is the accounting officer asked for the assessment? It's, it's the absence of evidence to, to make a value for money assessment uh, and uh, just the level of risk for the delivery of the. the <coughs> just maybe uh, there's some u unique features of this. I'll ask Patrick maybe to come in on them. Um, thank you, um, Chair. This one's slightly different to some of the previous um, directions in that the previous ones when the direction was sought um, had full detail agreed on how the scheme would be structured and how it would operate um, things around eligibility criteria and so had been agreed um, this scheme doesn't have that level of, of detail or, or, or policy agreement um, it, it's got an overarching plan um, but this direction has been sought from the minister to proceed with the scheme um, with those details not uh, totally um, finalised at the minute, so it, it's just slightly different from the others in that respect. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Muir, you've raised your hand. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just in relation to this, and it's been outlined, the detail um, isn't finally there in relation to this scheme. Uh, and just really a view whether it's, it's appropriate and in due order for a minister to sign off and give a ministerial <coughs> direction without having full details of the scheme, um, because that probably that's the first time I've seen something like that where the full details of the scheme aren't there, but yet there's a ministerial direction just to proceed regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how would I put it? This is one where the direction has come early. In other words, the accounting officers um, as for direction to proceed into the design stage, so so normally the direction would come come later. So um, I don't think there's anything untoward about it, but it's just unusual. So it came from the <coughs> accounting officer to the minister. Yes. Yeah. So okay. so the accounting officer is, is asked for the direction yeah. early in the process. I think that's how I would put it. Okay, Mr. Muir, does that? Uh, Address your concern. Uh, no, I understand that, 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 That's fine. Just, just one other thing. Um, it's probably there's a myriad of ministerial directions here today, and um, in most of those cases, it's been officials, permanent secretary, obviously, uh, pushing back and saying it's not been impossible to assess value for money. And I fully accept in relation to this ministerial direction, it would be it's impossible. To say that in terms of the value for money estimate around that, and also other sort of risks, is there any ever any opportunity for the minister to push back and say, "Can you, you know, have a go really and try to assess the value for money judgment in relation to this, or is it just once the permanent secretary says that, then the only option left for the minister then is to issue the direction? Well, usually it's about timing. Uh, most of them, and there's quite a lot of them, will be around the issue. We haven't had time. Uh, to, it's not that you couldn't construct a, a business case, uh, but uh, in the need to move at speed. Uh, so most of them are of that ilk. Uh, so in other words, uh, if you went through the full due process of um, a fully-fledged business case, um, you wouldn't be able to move at the pace that is needed. So most of them fall into that type of category. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much, Karen. I appreciate it. I understand that. And I think in any situation, if you wanted to go and do an economic appraisal and all the rest of it, that would probably take you well, a few weeks uh, at best. So that's a uh, useful clarification in relation to that. So thank you. I think one of the things uh, noticeable is that the proximity of all of these decisions and these schemes being put together. And and, and, um, and members being for surface, not least yourself, Mr. Muir, about support going out to help businesses in your constituency. There was a huge pressure on on civil servants. We need not forget that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important, Chair. And also, we're also we're putting all, including myself, and 
put on pressure upon the Department of Finance to ensure that no money was surrendered back to the centre. And I do commend the work that's been done by the departments and officials to ensure that that didn't occur, because that would have been an absolute dying shame to see money returned without it going out to assist people and businesses. So it's important that that context across. Absolutely. Mr. Beggs. <coughs> um, I, again, sort of, I haven't seen something like this at such an early stage before. Um, I, I was hoping to see in some of the background figure about the options that were considered, because to what extent has there been an assessment of how the extent that this will actually help the retail businesses and to what extent it will simply result in more imports from China? You know, that, that, that any of they will just encourage the, the purchase of more goods from elsewhere. Uh, so was there, should there not have been an assessment of what variety of mechanisms could be used to... to to make best use of the money? Um, I think what you mean there, uh, not uh, this is a voucher scheme, or, or you're thinking of alternatives? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and again, it's probably why that one as opposed to other mechanisms. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but also, there might be a case for um, when more of the design work is done for, for the department to come back to the committee uh, when, the, when they have more detail around this. Yeah. I'm just seeking clarification. What is the committee's role in all of these? Are we just being informed out of courtesy, or do we have any role? Well, well uh, it's the role uh, is to flag it up as a, an issue. Um, so, in other words, um, we're, it's the accounting officer in their letter of appointment. They're responsible for value for money and propriety, right. and uh, when they feel um, they can't discharge that or, or if they're asked to do something uh, where they can't meet that requirement then they can ask for a direction uh, and for many years uh, directions were quite rare you, you might have done only one or two a year we've just had a huge cluster of them really since COVID. Yeah. Which, which I think members need to be understanding of I mean government has to be agile and have that flexibility to respond to the pressures that constituents and businesses in particular were putting them under. In terms of the high street stimulus, stimulus scheme, I think, to be fair, they have said it has to be spent on the high street or in shops rather than on the internet. So I, yes. I don't think you can control the issue that Mr Beggs is talking about in terms of imports from other countries because you, know, you would simply not be able to control that. But at least they have put in place that it has to be spent on the high street and not on the internet. Uh, I suppose what the jury is out on is just how much it will help the high. How could you demonstrate it's how much it's going yeah. to help the high street? And yeah. I think that's the uncertainty yeah. where the uncertainty is. Okay, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. And just on the timing of this, I've got just a couple of questions just to, to, to understand the timing and the process. Um, the submission from Mike Brennan to the minister said the. Date is the 8th of March, and then revised on the 22nd of April. I'm not entirely clear why it was revised. Or did I miss that? In the um, I'll ask Patrick to come in on this. I know there was a lot of debate back earlier in the year. Could this initiative be got through before the end of the last financial, financial year? year? Yeah. And, and it wasn't. It just wasn't doable. Uh, Patrick will have a bit more insight into that. And Mr. Barr, do you want to come in? Yeah. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, I mean, as Kieran has mentioned, I mean, th this was um, originally due to go early, and yeah. so as that was delayed, um, due mainly to the uh, restrictions uh, and the department, understandably yeah. not wanting to send everyone out onto the high street. Um, as, as that was delayed, then further thinking continued, uh, and so they continued to um, make some changes around assumptions to the scheme and, and, and update it. And, and the minister was then using that to update, update executive colleagues. Was the direct? Just to be clear, was the do you know was the direction first agreed to or sought on the eighth of March for expenditure in financial year twenty twenty one rather than twenty one twenty two? Um, a, a paper was sent, but I don't think a final direction was given. Um, and then the direction was given uh, on the second paper. The second paper, okay. And, and is the, I mean, is it, but is the earliness of the seeking of the direction a product of the fact that they thought they were going to have to get it agreed and out the door before the end of the financial year? Because given where we are now, it appears that there's a little less time pressure. This looks like it will be an intervention 
to and, and you know to the extent that there is a an economic rationale to it, it would. Uh, and you've heard people in other jurisdictions say that you're probably better having a helicopter money stimulus later in the year whenever people have worn down. In the, right now, people are going out and spending savings that they've accumulated or, or just money that they cash on the hip that they have had because they've been in the house. Um, so I suppose the question I'm asking is, um, is the earliness of the direction a product of them trying to get it out the door, thinking that they were going to get it out the door earlier? Like, or did they did they need to this this direction as early as they did if given this happening later in the year? Um, the, that would the earliness um, originally intended is probably what um, made them start seeking the direction. Um, but then, um, as they further design of the scheme, um, I think at this stage, because some of the early steps they'll take in this scheme, because this scheme involves procurement. Um, and that will constitute commitment. So I think they want the direction early yeah. um, in the scheme before they start getting into those commitments. Well, that, so, I mean, this isn't, like, this, this kind of relatively novel stuff will always be harder to do. Eh? And I'm sure, like, Ulster University, with no harm to them, probably won't have an off the shelf model ready to say this will do this. So, so there's no easy value for money model that you can, you, the department can have. But um, are they obliged, having sought, this and receive this direction from the minister. Are they obliged to keep looking? To, to are they obliged to keep testing the value for value for money, or do they not really have to do that now that they've basically got a direction? Oh, oh um, I would expect them to yeah. to continue to look at that. So what we don't want is a direction as a get out of jail free card. Now the you know, yeah. that that um, the, uh, particularly with all of these things. Mistakes will be made. There are bound to be things that will go wrong. Uh, and what I'm preaching is uh, capture the learning of that, because there will be things that, that, that are not quite right. That's inevitable. So uh, they keep, the system needs to go back. If there are any design weaknesses yeah. or unintended consequences, they need to be picked up early. Because they have, yeah. I suppose the point is that yeah. this is not to carp, because this is, like, this is a scheme which is designed at speed in order to make an economic intervention. But given that it's happening now in slower time, there may well be refinements that can be made in order to better direct it, including live high street data now about how people are shopping uh -huh. things we open. No, that's right. We're really looking at a couple of schemes. It was the 10,000 and 25,000 schemes to support business. And was the reason we're doing that is uh, what learning can be actually taken from those in terms of, of the, future of course scheme, the other scheme design. If even rushed and got out um, before the financial year ended, you know, you certainly wouldn't be able to spend it in the shops because they weren't open. You know, there's another interesting sort of issue here. I suppose the rules on public money and government accounting are, you know, one of the basic rules is you don't pay money out in advance of need. Uh, but the way the budgetary system works sometimes works counter to that. So in other words, um, there was a big pot of COVID money. Uh, and there was a risk that some of it would be lost back to Treasury if it wasn't spent at year end. Now, there was some year end flexibility, uh, but I suppose and we're doing a separate piece of work on the budgetary system. Uh, it would be good to have more year end flexibility uh, so you don't have this uh, premature spending of money before it's, it, it's needed. Yeah. War in in case we're going to lose it. So, so the budgetary system doesn't help us here. That's okay. a wider issue. Of course, Mr. O'Toole makes mention of, of, of families that had money and they, they couldn't spend it or whatever, or whatever. You equally have other families who just simply, because of furlough scheme, because of the job being lost, who had, who had no money. Absolutely. Uh, and so therefore, you know, we need not forget that this is this will be a scheme which will be of help not just to the high street, but to help to those families as well. Okay, Mr. Muir, your hand is remaining up on the screen. Now you looking oh, back sorry, in. I will, I will lower it. Sorry, apologies. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then, if there are no other members, let's speak to um, five, which is the City of Derry Airport, London Derry, and the London Public Service Obligation Route, pages 12 to 42 of your pack. Members are referred to correspondence from Mr. Donnelly, dated the 24th of May 2021, your table packs 14 to 16, regarding a ministerial direction to fund the City of Derry Airport. Uh, so London Public Service Obligation Route post uh, March 2021. 
Uh, Mr. Brennan, the a county officer for the Department of County Economy, wrote to the CNAG on the 20th of April to advise he had a sought a ministerial direction from uh, Minister Dodds on the 11th of February 2021. And if you recall, the airport was subject of uh, previous directions in 20, uh, 2007 and 2020, which supported funding to maintain and develop the airport and its infrastructure. Indeed, I remember us discussing it one day in the chamber, and the assembly chamber. This direction and detail below, however, relate to the public service obligation route and not to the general funding of the airport. The background is that in 2017, <coughs> Westminster's Department of Transport and granted a public uh, service obligation between City of Derry Airport and London. Uh, initially, DFT agreed to fund 88% of the required costs and the local council initially paying the other 12%. Department of Transport indicated they plan to reduce the funding uh, share from 88% to 50% post-May 2019 in line with their wider national policy. Department of the Economy agreed to review the position and there has been a number of changes to the funding model used to support the route over the last few years. These are detailed more fully in Annex A. Department of Economy has no baseline funding for this particular London route and the costs have been met uh, through in-year bids. The Department of Transport officials have confirmed they will be recommending a 50% funding split for the, their ministers from June 2021 to March 23. And the Department of Transport having already agreed to provide 88% of the funding from April and May 2021 Assuming the Department of Transport uh, Minister's fund at 50%, this would mean there would be a funding pressure of £900,000 in 21-22 and £1.1 million in 22-23. Members, the Controller and Auditor General to provide the relevant correspondence on pages 17 to 42 of your table pack, which underpinned the decision to proceed with the proposal. CNAG will keep this matter under review as the uh, audit of the 2020-21 financial statements progresses and he plans to audit the programme for the 2021-22 financial statements. Mr Donnelly, anything you want to add? Uh, I think you've covered all the main points there, Chair. Nothing okay. to add as well. Members? Mr Beggs? Uh, I, I say originally there is a... Uh, um, this council were paying 12% uh, towards the cost of it. Uh, that's then moving to zero, and 100% is being paid for either by the Department of the Economy or the Department of Transport. So, uh, just curious as to whether um, there's an awareness of uh, in other locations would there normally be a a, a localised contribution towards it, or is it 100% public funded elsewhere? Uh, I don't know. I, I can, we can look into that, uh, Mr. Beggs. I don't have a, an answer off the top of my head. And what I read, it did, did talk uh, about uh, coming in line with national policy. So that's dropping the media yeah. to fifty percent. Uh, I mean, for me, the, the, the one of the important things is, you know, and it's not for me to talk about the financial viability of the airport, but the, the there is an issue, obviously, about the ongoing viability of the airport, and therefore expending money on a particular route, and um, it's important that this money is is provided as a pump primer for routes. But if there's a question mark over the, uh, the viability of the airport itself, you know, is there is there an issue? Because um, that's something which uh, um, I would ask the the, the uh, audit office to keep an, keep an eye on. Because obviously this airport requires considerable subvention from the local council. Yes. And uh, the Department of Infrastructure. We the last time we discussed uh, ministerial director, it was a director from the Department of Infrastructure of an injection of money into the airport. Isn't that right? Yes, uh, this is something we actively look at every year as part of the audit of the council, actually. So, so it is a burden, and it's a burden on the council as well as the mm. department. Yeah. Mr. Uh, yeah, I was very, very briefly going to say, that, I mean, this is more a broader policy comment, but there are, uh, I mean, this sort of fits in with the city deal stuff. stuff. There's a, a, there is an interaction, and it's been discussed in the context of the city deal, um, uh, I mean, I suppose I might, um, uh, to go back to a, a perennial hobby horse of mine, if we were to negotiate with Whitehall uh, the, a reduction in our block grant reduction to pay for long, theoretical long-haul APD flights, which, which costs our, 
us two and a half million pounds a year, but we don't have any long haul long haul flights out of Aldergrove, and we probably aren't going to, given the state of global aviation. We would more than meet the cover the, the, any subsidy to to, to Derry City if we were to to, to to reduce that. So maybe I'll write. Put, maybe I should put that in a letter myself to um, to, to to either DFT in London or to the. Um, to the economy department. It's certainly oh, absolutely nothing to do with the ministerial director we're talking about. Today. No, it's um, not. I'm just abusing the. But, but, the, the but, you, but once again, you've abused the system. Apologies. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Mr. McHugh. Uh, and just if I would like to add the comment as well, too, that uh, where they've done the uh, business case now for the city of Derry Airport previously, you know, they acknowledged the very fact that. I think those costs and some of these, I think, would be 10 to 11 million pounds. That is a contribution to the local economy was somewhere in the region of 18 million at that time. Uh, that uh, where it was regarded as a vital element in the cog of the development of the infrastructure in the northwest area. And I welcome to the discussions that have been held recently only. That where they have uh, approached uh, the Legal Council that as well too to help to sustain and maintain the airport, given that up to 60% of the travellers and that uh, through the South Derry Airport actually come from the Donegal region as well. Okay. Does that mean, Mr. Bank? Uh, I would just um, <coughs> think that there's been ongoing issues for the Auditor General to keep a, 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 a a uh, close eye on, particularly with the development of the A6, which is making transport links by road to the main airports, or to Dublin Airport for that matter, much, much swifter. Okay, okay, members, and um, so, um, can I then, if members are all content, uh, then can I just say that, um, Members, just to confirm again that the delays in these ministerial directions coming to the committee are being investigated by the CNAG and that Mr Brennan, uh, the accounting officer the Department of the Economy, will be with the committee on the 17th of June to discuss further. Members, we will now go into closed session to discuss the issue papers for evidence session on the speeding up of the justice system. Order.